very, very warm, warm welcome as, uh, you know, Elliot and Tiffany are dear, dear friends of ours and uh, some of our best friends, man. We love you. We love you. Why don't you guys give it up for your pastors? Come on. Y'all can do a little bit better than that. Man, they, uh, they, they love you. They love you. Seriously, they love you. They, they pray over you. They cry over you. They tell us, they tell me all your stuff. I'm just, I'm just messing with you. It's all good. I don't know any, I don't know any names. I don't know your stuff. I just know, man, this one person, they just, EGR, man, they need some extra grace required, you know? You might have an acronym passed, you know, on your name. It's all good. I'm, I'm just messing with you guys. They love you tremendously. And I'm excited to be here this morning. My name's Aaron. I'm the lead pastor of Radius Church, just across the tracks in Stockton. And uh, pray for Stockton, everybody. Pray for Stockton. They need Jesus. So, but um, I'm excited to be here. And I believe that God is doing an amazing work. Uh, and I see God doing amazing work in this church in this last year. The stories that's coming out is nothing short of amazing. But I believe that the best is yet to come. How many of you believe that? How many of you believe that the best is yet to come? Awesome. And the best is yet to come, not just happening to you, but the best is yet to come happening through you. Can I get a good amen? Amen. By the way, there's, there's, an, there, there's an unforeseen scripture that, said, that says this, blessed are the short-winded for they shall be heard again. Right? So, and, and the, I, I preach shorter the more interaction that I get. Can I get a good amen? Yeah. Oh, there you go. That's the best amen I had. That's awesome. 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 But I believe, honestly, I believe in a talk back culture. When you say amen, that actually means so be it in my life. And so you're asking God for that revelation to be permanent, to have its permanence in our heart and in our life. Let's pray and we'll get right to today's message. Father God, we come before you today and we thank you for who you are and what you're doing in our hearts and in our lives. We ask you, God, today to speak to us. Lord, help us to see in your word what you want us to see. Help us to know what you want us to know and to become, God, who you called us to become. Mark our hearts, God, and change our lives today. We ask you, God, that your word would root deep in our soul in Jesus' name. And God, that there be, that, that, that it would go deep into the soil of our life, Father God, that it would produce lasting change on the inside of us. But I ask you, God, that it would never just stay there with us, that that word would come out of us, God, into our families, into our workplaces, into our environments, and into this world, God, that we would make the biggest difference that we possibly could make with our lives, and that you get all the glory and all the praise and all the honor for everything. We thank you for it. In in Jesus' name, and those who agree with me said, Amen. Amen. Here's the question of today. It is December 31st. It's the last day of the year. Tomorrow is New Year's Day. We're entering into a new year, and here's the deal. A lot of us have this uh, idea and this focus of, man, I want to make this next year, 2024, the best year possible. I mean, you all want to make the ne- this next year possible. You want to make it the best. And so if we want to do that, there's some things we got to leave behind, and some things we got to leave behind and some things we got to embrace. So today's message really is entitled Do Over. Somebody say Do Over. Do Over. Well, turn to the person next to you and say Do Over. Do Over. turn to the other person you decided to ignore and say Do Over. <laughs> there's, there's grace for you too. There's grace for you too. And so uh, Do Over. Now here's the deal. How many of y'all ever have family game night? Yes. Family game night. Now you know when family game night happens, it gets a little crazy. How many of y'all are talking about and you got people, you know, trying to get everybody just not to cheat. Right? That's, that's kind of what you're trying to do. You're trying to get them not to cheat, and then you're trying to get them to play fair and not gloat when they win four times in a row. Man, just the other, you know, hey, okay, I, you know some, sometimes I gloat a little. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. But, you know, my kids, they gloat. And, and it's funny how now my youngest and my oldest, they were playing dominoes just like last week. And uh, I know this domino game. And, and my youngest son, you know, he's the one who like, he's braggadocious. If you know my son, Marshall, man, he just, he, he, and he gets underneath the skin of his oldest brother. And his oldest brother, his, he's 19, he's a sophomore in college. And uh, you would think that he, you know, he, he usually collects himself kind of mature at times. He's trying to, you know, trying to grow into his new adulthood identity. But nothing makes him go back into a teenage kid like his little brother trying to gloat on him. You know what I'm talking about? Little brother's good like that. And so he won four games in a row, little brother, and the little brother's just crushing him at dominoes. And, and it's not just him. My wife is playing. The other kids are playing. And, man, they're trying to, they're, they're just trying to navigate this game. And so Marshall, he's, he's, this whole time, he's, like, crushing everybody. But then what happens is when, when you do 15 and you're playing uh, from 15 all the way to zero, it's a long game. It's a few hours, right? 
Well, for the last four hands, Zachary won the last four hands. That didn't sit very well with Marshall. He, he was not having that. He was not having that. He was like, and so at, at the end, I counted up all the points, and sure enough, Zach beat Marshall in dominoes. And as the story goes, Marshall kind of flipped out. Y'all don't have no kids like that that flip out when they lose something. <laughs> I am that kid. Yeah, it's like, I am that kid. So, like, that's why I, this is why I didn't participate and I just watched. <laughs> but here's the deal. Like, like, I see all this and then our kid's like, no, we got to play again. I want to do over. I want to, we got to do this again. I want to, I want to do over because I thought I was winning and I actually ended up losing or I started off well, but even though when I started off well, I actually didn't end up finishing well. And so many of us in life, we actually end up starting well. January and February is good. Maybe March is okay, but somewhere along the line, we kind of went back into some old habits and we went back into some old ways. And even though you're here today and you're like, man, we're we're trying to finish this year strong. How many of y'all want to leave some things back in 2023 and embrace what God asked for you in 2024? Right? So here's the deal. Like we have this idea of, okay, I I need a do-over. I I, I, want a do-over and I'm going to change some things. So how do I go from, from, from who I am now, from where we are now, to becoming who God wants us to be? So instead of next year saying, well, I'm in the same place, I'm in the same situations, I'm in the same struggle, what if you could say, I reached my goals? And so this whole message today as I was preparing it, it's this understanding, this idea that we want, that we want to leave the past behind to be better and embrace what God has for us, but to just not, not just to embrace it, but to actually have a plan for change, to have a plan for change. Like I want to be better tomorrow than I am today, because how many of you guys know this? There's the me that I could see, and then there's the me that I wish that I could be. And the me that I wish that I could be has great behaviors and responds fantastic under pressure and always chooses joy and not frustration, right? Who, who's always faithful, who says the right things. That's the me that I, that I wish that I could be. And I, I, don't, I think that there's a tension in our soul that we live with where we are now and where we ought to be. But how do we embrace that? How do we actually get that? How do we really change how do we actually change in life? Because here's what I know. I know that you can write this down if you're taking notes, that awareness is good, but awareness isn't enough. Awareness is great, and it's a fantastic place to start to admit to yourself that you need to change, but awareness is enough. And the next thing is, is that good intentions, they're also not enough. Good intentions is not enough. It's like buying a treadmill, and all of a sudden you feel healthy. I never felt so healthy after I bought that treadmill. I never took one step on it, but I actually feel fantastic because I had a great intention, right? So we, we, we usually like to judge others on what they actually do, and we judge ourselves based on our intentions. Thank you for your overwhelming response. But change happens when you and I embrace or engage in a process. When we engage in a a process, that's when change starts to happen. And in fact, write this down somewhere that that the progress is actually found in the process. It's found in the process. And so when we're talking about change, we're talking about how to actually change. A lot of people look for this single moment, this epiphany, where we're actually going to change and it's going to help us change. That magically we become motivated to change just out of thin air. And it never happens like that. Motivation never, hardly ever comes before an action. It always comes when you take a step of faith. Because the progress is found in the process, but you got to be willing to engage that process. And for a lot of us, you didn't get to where you are overnight, and you're not going to come out of some things overnight either. Now, the healing and forgiveness can happen instantaneous. By the way, that is salvation. That's the greatest news of the world. That it happens in an instant. You take all your sin and all your shame and you come to a loving father and you ask him for forgiveness to be the Lord and Savior of your life. And he cleanses you immediately with that shame and that guilt. gone, Free and instantaneous. Someone say a good amen right there. Isn't that, aren't you grateful for the amazing grace of Jesus Christ? Man, he's amazing. But here's the deal. Even though that is, you're freely forgiven, 
and the shame is gone, you have to actually start to walk in freedom. And it takes a process to do that. Here's the thing. Human beings, we don't like processes. We like projects. We like pro- we, we don't want to wait normally. We don't want to wait 50 minutes in the oven. We want the minute and a half microwave. Come on, somebody. Right? It's a, so much easier to do that hot pocket. <laughs> it's so much easier to, to, to really ha- to have those things. You know, we, we, we like teeth whiteners. We don't want to brush twice a day. <laughs> Isn't that right? So we, want, so we want to like work out a little bit and have some intense efforts. We want to maybe change our eating habits, lose a little weight, you know, reach a certain goal. And then we want to go back to the way it was before. We don't like processes. A lot of times people challenge even what I preach and what, what us pastors preach. And they say, you know, especially in relationships, like, hey, man, hey, dude, like, you know, you, you need to be kind to your wife. You need to be kind to your spouse. Like, okay. And so this guy goes in, he does it. He's like, all right, all right, Aaron, here's the deal. Like, I washed the dishes for my wife and I didn't get the response that I wanted to get. Yeah. Don't elbow nobody. Everybody just look straight right now. <laughs> it's like, bro, if you've been like ignoring her and treating her badly for a long time, one single act is not going to suffice for a change of heart. But by the way, ladies, if you notice him doing something, an attaboy is pretty good. How about this? People tell us to me, pastor, like I gave my life to Christ and I still have problems, but now I struggle with guilt. I'm like, hey, congratulations. You have a conscience. That's a good thing. Right? That's, that's a good thing. But I think people have these notions that if I do something right, especially if it's new or if it's a struggle for me to do, me to do that somehow God's going to see that and he's going to change everything. I want you to open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, because I believe Jesus had some incredible words of wisdom for us, and he gives us a template for real change. And it's in a scripture that maybe you've never seen before, or in a scripture maybe you gloss over because you don't truly understand. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is, is preaching a sermon on the mount, and this is where he gives us a template for real change. Did I get like a water? Cool. Matthew 5, verses 29 to 30 says this. It says, so if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose a part of your body than to have all of it thrown into hell. And if your right hand leads you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose part of your body than to have all of it go into hell. And God's people said, yeah, exactly. That was we like. That's. Are you sure that's in the Bible? Like, what translation are you reading out of? This is the words of Jesus. I'm gonna read this again, just so you understand it. So, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. For it's better for you to lose a part of your body than to have all of it thrown into hell. And if your right hand leads you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose part of your body than to have all of it go into hell. Now, these are some really difficult words to stomach. Jesus, this is crazy. But Jesus uses parables. By the way, this is a parable. He's not actually telling you to cut off your hand. He uses parables like this all the time. Um, And it wasn't, again, literally wasn't telling them to do that. Don't gouge out your, your eye. He's using this extreme example to tell his disciples, this is what change looks like. If you want to know what change really looks like, it's this. And here's the first process. I want you to write this down in your notes. I promise you, if, 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 if you pay attention and you understand how this template works for real change, you actually have real lasting change. It won't just be a fix. It'll be a change in your life. The first thing is this. The first word is that it's drastic. Jesus is teaching this here. And what he's saying is, is you need a drastic change. When you gouge out your eye, I mean, y'all believe that's, that's pretty drastic. That's drastic. And I think for many of us, the reason why we haven't made any progress is we haven't done anything drastic. We want simple changes. And what Jesus is saying, hey, when you're dealing with mistakes and sin and issues in our life, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work with just simple, you need a drastic change. Here's the question, how drastic are you willing to get? How drastic are you willing to get? 
How, how drastic are you willing to get? And I believe the answer to this, and I, hope, I would hope the answer to this would be, whatever is required to make changes, Lord, I'm willing to do. How drastic. And the reason why we're going over this message And when we're talking about how to actually have real change is because if we truly want to embrace this next year, we got to be honest and we got to be real with ourselves. How many of y'all believe honesty is is important in our life? Uh One person. Fantastic. So (laughs) it's okay. I, I got lights on me. I can't see all your faces. But whatever is required, I need to do. So some of us may, may need to turn like the internet down at our house. Or, or I know we're getting ready to go into a fasting season. We're going to talk about that here at the end. But maybe we need to turn some of the world down. Maybe, maybe there's some things that we need to, to, to clean out. Or maybe, maybe you need to tell somebody what you're really going through. Maybe you need to take off the mask and tell, tell somebody. Because cutting, cutting off your hand, what is it? It's drastic. Here's the second thing. Now, it's not only drastic. Number two, it's limiting. Someone say limiting. limiting. So it's limiting. So it's not only is it drastic, but it's limiting. If you gouge out your eye, you're not going to see any more of that eye. Yeah. If your hand is gone, you can't grab anything. And what Jesus is saying here is that part of the reason why we haven't experienced real change, lasting change, is that you haven't been able to limit yourself. And I would probably bet that the area in our life that we'd be most willing to change is the area that we have the fewest restrictions in. That we want to see change is that I want to see so much change in here because I've allowed my life to go really wild in this area. I have very few restrictions. In other words, you pretty much let yourself do whatever you want to do. So Jesus is saying the process for change is the willingness to limit yourself. I think we have a misunderstanding of how limitation, how sometimes how limitations work. Because when I grew up, sometimes, I mean, I grew up in a Christian household. But even when I was a teenager, I thought, man, if I serve God, it means he's going he's gonna to take away all my fun. <laughs> he's going to take away all my fun. I don't get to do anything fun. I get to see all these other people doing all these different things. It looks like fun. The world looks like fun. And yet, I got to do, man, I know I have to do what's right. And so it's like, man, I just, I just had this misguided understanding of what limitations was, that actually the things that I didn't do kept me from experiencing hardship in my life. It's kind of like the dog that, that is, you know, really, you could say the homeless dog that's set free. I have a dog, his name is Scout, and he's a big old boy. And you know, we have a misguided understanding maybe of freedom, because I could let Scout out of his kennel and say, hey, you're free, buddy. Freedom. Go, go wherever you want. Do whatever you want. You, like, you deserve to be free, right? Like, like, nature is wild. You should be wild. Yeah. <laughs> now, here's the deal. I could, I could let him out and, and totally remove all the confines. But how many of y'all know there's a likelihood he could run away? There's a very high likelihood he could go out and get hit by a car. Or he could actually go so far that where all of a sudden he's hungry and he's homeless. You see what I'm saying with this? And so here's the deal. What was once meant for freedom where there were no boundaries, now all of a sudden he ends up in a frustrated, lonely place. And that there actually was the best that he ever added were within the scope of the limitations that we set. God has limitations for you in a scope that he set in his word. But by the way, there's freedom in that because he knows the pathway. He knows your purpose. He knows your future. He knows everything about your life. He says, hey, listen, I've set up the parameters of your life and there's actually freedom within the limitations that I've given you. And if you would trust in the limit, if you would trust my pathway, you would experience ultimate freedom in your life. So don't look on the other side. Don't stop trying to look on the other side. The grass isn't greener on the other side. Maybe they just watered it and you didn't. So limitations give us the freedom to be what we're really supposed to be. And when we live within the boundaries of God's word, we become what we're meant to be. So again, 
Here's a question. What are you willing to limit in your life to see change? What are you willing to limit in your life to see change? Okay, here's the next thing. Here's the next thing in Matthew chapter 5 is it's abnormal. It's abnormal. You look weird. You cut your hand off and gouge your eye out. You're only going to look cool at a costume party being a pirate. That's it. That's it. Like, that's it. Any other time, it ain't going to look good. Now imagine the person that comes up to you and you're like, bro, what happened to your eye? Oh, imagine what they're going to they're gonna think. I'll gouge it out. You do what? What? I gouged it out. I'm not that way anymore. I look different. I am different. And see, for a lot of us, normal life has gotten us to where we are. And it's going to take a drastic change. It's going to take something. It's going to take for us to actually look abnormal, to tell another person, hey, you know what? This is the way that it is now. This is the way that it's no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me. And this life that I live in the flesh, the life that I live in my normal life, this life that I live now, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That person maybe you once knew, they're dead. This is who I am. I'm going to allow everybody to see the abnormal changes in my life. It's abnormal, but it's changed. The question is, is how really are you willing to be? Are you willing to be abnormal? Here's the next one is this, write this down, is that it's permanent. It's permanent. Those things don't just grow back. (laughs) Your arm just doesn't grow back. Your your eye is not going to automatically grow back. It's a permanent decision. It's a permanent decision. And here's the thing that I believe, and this this is important for us, and we're talking about real change and how to change. When it's permanent, I think some of us have some angst in our soul with this. Because I think for a lot of us, we don't really try to, we don't really change. We don't really try to change. You see, this is not something I'm trying for a while. This is something I'm convincing myself. This is the way that it is now. This is who I am now. A lot of us have tried a few things out for a while, tried church out for a while, tried God out for a while. And then when it's not convenient for us, we walk away. And a lot of that is because we based our Christianity on ourselves. And not on our Savior. But here's the deal. I think for, for a lot of people is this. We don't want change we want to fix. And there's a difference between fixing something and changing something. Because a fix is really just a temporary relief to get our life back to normal. I just want to get my life back to normal. I'm just going to try to to fix this. I'm just going to try to fix my relationship. You know, uh, if I do enough good things, if I if I say enough things, if I let enough time pass, if I if I just check a couple of boxes, then everything will go back to normal. Right? It's like that infomercial that you see all the time. Eat all the same great foods and (laughs) go down, and you can still go down to this size. And we're like, really? What, what are they? They're trying to get you to buy based upon your pain, but based upon fixing something rather than really change. And the problem is we've tried these things out for a while and we've never made a decision to change. And once it becomes too painful, it's easy to fall back into the same habits. I think there's this idea in our country that you can do everything just the same and change will happen. And it's not true. It's not true. Again, this is Matthew chapter 5. Jesus is telling us, hey, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it out. If your right eye causes you to sin, cut it out. Gouge it out. Why? He said, because I, I want you to have change in your life. Here's the last one. Is that it's painful. It's painful. Jesus didn't say, you got anesthesia while you're cutting your hand off. <laughs> That's not what he says here. You got to be conscious to make this happen. It's going to be a painful procedure. It's going to be painful, man. If you're going to experience real change, it's going to be a painful experience. And you're going to say, man, I can't stay here. I got to move forward. Here's the question, though. 
What type of pain are you going to experience? Because here's the deal. You're all going to experience pain. We're all going to experience pain. What type? Is it the pain of purpose or is it the pain of regret? Because you're going to experience it. The pain of purpose or unnecessary pain. Can I just tell you this? That the pain of sacrifice always hurts less than the pain of regret. The pain of sacrifice always hurts less than the pain of regret. Like working out is painful. It burns. I still don't understand it. I don't like working out. People are like, and I, you know, and, and I have a plan to get fit. I'm like, oh man, you must love the gym. No, I don't. I don't love the gym, right? I mean, I love the holidays this last month. You know what I'm saying? Amen. Come on, somebody. Come on. I, I wasn't on a diet this last month. I was on a try it. You know what I mean? <laughs> What's that? Hey, I'll try it. That's, some of y'all was on, on that same one too. It's the try it diet. But I mean, getting back to this next season, I got some goals. Some of them I've completed. But I got some new goals for this next year. But man, I, I, I don't love working out. I just know I need to do it. I, this body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I've got to do what God told me to do. But it's painful working out burns. But if I don't do it, if I don't diet at all, if I don't change anything on the outside, then I know, although maybe not immediate, that pain, the pain of regret, is going to sting a lot more. It's going to come with other issues in life. Again, it's better to lose one part of your body than it says for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And what he's talking about is it's better for you to deal with this situation than for your dreams to die and your goals to die and your relationships to struggle. Are you, are you listening to me, church? And here's what I believe. I believe that you will not change until you're complete, completely convinced that the pain of staying the same is far worse for you than the pain of change. I'm going to read that again. I believe you won't change until you're completely convinced that the pain of staying the same is far worse for you than the pain of change. And so here's the deal. This is the process that Jesus lays out for us. But the real issue, I believe, it is not surface level. It, it lies deep down on the inside of us. It, it lies deep on the inside of our life. And God wants to heal you. He wants you to change. And I believe he's using this Matthew chapter 5 as an extreme example for you to truly understand what it's going to take to embrace what God has for you this year. That it's going to be painful. and You may look abnormal. And there, that may be some limitations. But if you do what he called you to do and you say yes to his plan and his way, that he'll bring you out on the other side. So here's this question. Okay, 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 Aaron, you, you've convinced me this is what I need to do. And I know this message is heavy. I get it. And I prayed, man, should I give this message? I know it's heavy, but here's the deal. I believe that God has his best plan for you. But for you to embrace it, you need to say yes to him. So here's the question. How do I start? How do I start? How do I start doing this? How do I start doing this? First thing is I, I would say is number one, you need to pray and you need to ask God which change you should start, which change you should begin. So one thing and not everything. One thing. And can I just say, can I just, can I just give you, can I just help you out the, the first thing? Going all in with Jesus, mm -hmm. saying yes. Yeah. I mean, th there's a fast coming up. Mm -hmm. If you give the first, I believe that when you give God the first, he blesses the rest. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And so here's the deal. One thing, not everything. Pick one thing that you could change and let that victory translate into other areas of your life. But I think the first way to real honest change is you got to be honest with yourself. You got to be honest with yourself. We got to stop lying to ourselves. Come on. Yeah, I think if we lied to others as much as we lied to ourselves, we wouldn't have any friends. <laughs> and so here's the good news. Here's the good news. I want to I tell you some good news today. We talked about this change, but I, let me give you some hope. John 8, 36 says this. So if the sun sets you free, 
you are free indeed. Somebody say free. free. Come on, somebody say it louder. Say free. free. Jesus died so we could be free. If the son, if Christ sets you free, then you are free indeed. Philippians 4.13 says this, for I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Come on, say it with me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Come on, say it again. Say it with me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is what I can tell you. You can do everything that God has called you to do. You can do everything in the scripture that he told you to do. I know there is this tension in your soul between where you are and where you want to be, but it's through Christ that you can accomplish the mission and, and, and the progress and the purpose that he has for you. It's through Christ that you can do that. And let me just tell you this, what you have now plus God is enough. What you have plus God is enough to do what? To do everything that he's called you to do. To take every necessary step to fulfill your destiny, to fulfill your purpose in Christ. What you have plus God is enough. So never disqualify the grace of God that is on the inside of you. Never disqualify the purpose of God that is on the inside of you. Never disqualify your calling. For you are the head and you are not the tail. You are not what your past says you are. You are who God says you are. You are who God says that you are. What you have plus God is enough. I wanted to close with this because we talk about change. Sometimes can we think, wow, that's just, that's a lot, Pastor Aaron. That's a lot. And I know I want to to embrace that, but there's this tension. No, what you have plus God Mm -hmm. is enough. He has called you, chosen you, appointed you to be here in this season for this time, for this purpose to not only fulfill his dreams for your life, but so that his dreams can move in you and through you towards the lives of others. God wants you to make a difference. So here's the last, here's a couple more scriptures and then I'm done. Galatians chapter five, verse one says this. So Christ has truly set us free. Now watch this. Now make sure that you stay free. Hmm. So Christ has set us free. Now make sure that you stay free. Well, how do I stay free? Well, it's that plus God. Whatever you have plus God is enough. God has a system. God has a system that he uses to keep us in freedom, that fulfills our purpose, and that lives out our destiny. Not on the screen, Ephesians 3.10 says this, it was his intent now that through the church, that the manifold wisdom of God will be made known. So it's through what? The church. God's system is the church. Ephesians 4, 15 says, we're gonna speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the what? Who is the head of his body, the church. And so here's the deal. God's system to stay in freedom God sits up, you're you're, you're free from sin and shame when you receive Christ, when you repent and turn to God. But to walk out healing, you need others. For freedom to have a continual walk out in your life and accountability in your life, you need others. You need the church. And so the church will help you. This is the process of change. So some of you need to take that step. You need to get in the growth track. That's the next step for you. Small groups are coming up. You need to jump into a small group. Why? Because church doesn't just happen in rows. It happens in circles. And you probably can't name the last five messages that you heard, but you can name five people that have changed your life. Relationships, relationships, relationships matter. Purpose matters. Get in a small group. How about this? Start off with a fast. 21 days of prayer and fasting is coming up. It's coming up next week. So it's growth track, by the way. These are steps that you can take to say yes to God, to say yes to his plan, to say yes to change. I'm going to embrace 2024 as a year of change where God lives out his purposes in my life in Jesus' name. That's, and if you believe that and you want to declare that, Take some steps, whatever that's, maybe you need to lead a small group. 
Maybe God is calling you to leave. Maybe you've taken some steps and it's like, man, I, but I feel like there is more. Maybe God, maybe leadership is moving on the inside of your life and in your heart right now. God said, I've called you and chosen you to actually step out into faith and to lead a group. I don't know what the process is at this church to do that. Talk to the pastors and they'll definitely get you connected. I promise you that. Because there's greatness on the inside of you. I believe that if you take these necessary steps, you're going to see real change in your life, just like Jesus said for us to walk in. Amen, everybody. Amen. Would you bow your heads today? Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father God, in Jesus' name, for your life, the things that were spoken today. I ask you, God, that it, it root deep in our hearts in the name of Jesus. I ask you, God, for a performance of the things that were said today, that the word that was spoken today, Father God, that there be a performance of it in Jesus' name. I ask you, God, to give us the grace and the wisdom to say yes to you, to say yes to your plan, to say yes to your way, Lord Jesus to enter into this new year finally focused where we can shake off the path and become and create a new normal in our life to embrace your kingdom in our life and to let our light shine before men that they will see your good works and glorify you in heaven. I thank you, God, for doing a deep work in the name of Jesus. With every head bowed, every eye closed in this room, I want to give you an opportunity and a chance to maybe get your life right with God. Maybe you're here and, you're, and, you're, and your life isn't right with God, but he's knocking on the door of your heart this morning. He's saying, hey, would you allow me to forgive you? Would you allow me to heal you? Would you allow me to set your path? And if you're here today and that's you, on the count of three, I'm just going to ask you to lift your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I need, I need to give my life to Christ or I need to renew my commitment to Christ. I'm not going to have you stand up or come down to the front. I'm not just going to try to embarrass you. I'm going to connect you to Jesus. But Jesus did say in his word, he said, if you acknowledge me before men, he said, I will acknowledge you before my father, which is in heaven. And your uplifted hand, that's what that does. So here on the count of three, under the sound of my voice, if you need to give your life back to Christ, and set the precedent in your life to move forward in 2024, letting the past go and embracing all that God has for you. He's saying, Pastor, that's me. I need to renew my commitment. Or I need to just come to God. I want to lead you into prayer. On the count of three, just lift your hand. One, two, three. As I will see. Yes, I see it. Yes, in the back. Yes, 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 yes. I see it. Every hand's a yes, 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 yes. In the back, yes. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to lead you into prayer. God's going to see you right now where you're at. And we're going to say, I'm, I'm going to give you the words. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to say them after me. Believe them in your heart. Say them with your mouth. God will meet you. He will forgive you. He will restore you. And he will set you on the pathway towards freedom. But as we do, we, we do all of this as a family. So I want you to say this out loud as a family. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you today. And I believe you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to die for me. I receive him now as my Savior and that's my Lord. Jesus, I give you the control of my life. And I choose to follow you from this moment forward. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for loving me. My life is yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, church. Let's celebrate all those that gave their life to Christ.